should be. Um, can everybody hear me? I want to make sure if you're having technical problems, let me know. If for some reason you cannot get the slides uh, as a handout, um, I would ask you to. Um, uh, I would ask you to. Is, uh, is uh, can hear me okay? And then we'll go from there. Thank you for for your patience on that because I don't want to get into any technical problems uh, as we go ahead. Anyways, this is a great uh, one of my favorite topics. Um, frankly. Um, it's probably the most uh, interesting or most attended topic uh, whenever I discuss it because it should be uh, the focus of everybody's anti-corruption program, at least anti-corruption and probably many other issues, which is uh, third-party risk management. And it just doesn't mean, and before I get to my promo here, it just doesn't mean that um, you know, you run third parties through due diligence and then go off and, and work with them. Uh, this is more a holistic type issue, which has to do with who are the people that you deal with outside of your company. So you can control people, hopefully, within your company, but when you get outside your company, you lose the ability to gain that control. So let's talk first a uh, little promo piece, and I apologize for that. Uh, the Volkoff Law Due Diligence Services, we, uh, we are very involved in this issue. We help companies from conducting individual due diligence uh, reviews uh, to designing programs, to designing policies, to designing auditing and monitoring features. Um, in, and, and we have a flat fee service where we uh, will offer help on individual type situations. And then we, um, we get all the way into sort of focus due diligence and, uh, and go from there. So we also um, provide legal opinions, which are very important in my view. And we include specific recommendations and contractual provisions uh, that will help you to reduce your risk. Um, we, uh, and then, if necessary, we'll do an enhanced due diligence type of review. Uh, one other promo piece. Uh, we just started a new podcast service, so please subscribe. Um, we've, uh, we'll try to address hot compliance topics. Uh, episode one was a uh, review of the Trump administration enforcement priorities. Episode two, which is our new language for compliance, is uh, ethics and profits. And episode three, coming out next Monday, is examination of the latest undercover FCPA sting case, a very interesting case, the Baptiste case. And uh, we'll try to interview some folks that are interesting and we'll look at compliance program elements and put together something with, that we hope is, uh, is helpful to you. So um, with that said, let's get to some of the topics here uh, and get to this. So when we look at uh, um, third party risk management, we always have to start with what I call answering the three key cap questions. What's your purpose? What's your scope? And how are you defining the risks? Um, in my view, your number one purpose is to protect your company's culture from third party conduct. That's not just FCPA liability, as you'll see. Uh, we also are going to figure out how to allocate resources, uh, which are limited to minimize the risk and usually through a risk ranking process and putting in certain procedures, standard procedures. We also want to, and this is where it gets more tricky, is to protect your company from reputational harm. You do not want to have in your supply chain, even though they don't create FCPA liability, but you don't want to have slave labor, you don't want to have a company that's disreputable uh, in and uh, that's going to bring harm to your company's reputation and standing in the community, in the marketplace, uh, and overall. What's weird is when you talk to directors, and this shows you a little bit of detachment on their part, but you ask them what's the biggest problem that they have with regard to uh, an enforcement matter or an investigation, they'll tell you the biggest risk to them is reputational harm to the company. They don't care about paying 100 to 200 million, well, they do care. But in the end, the biggest risk they have is their reputational harm. And we, of course, want to avoid government investigations and enforcement actions. But that's not the primary purpose, in my view, of third-party risk management. 
So then we have to go to our scope. What's the scope of our third parties that we're looking at? And usually I use the term third parties and it covers um, not only just agents, distributors, resellers, but it includes consultants that you hire outside of your company, lobbyists who assist you in legislative matters or regulatory matters, vendors, suppliers, uh, nominees on, for companies in local, you know, in certain countries. And you have to have a local uh, representative in that country. Um, you will hire a nominee of some sort. Or you have, let's say, delegations of authority or powers of attorney that are given out to people around the globe. You've got to make sure that you uh, conduct some kind of due diligence because they create risk for you. Then we're going to define our risk. We have FCPA, we have sanctions, we have AML, we have lots of ways to uh, define risks that are legal. Those are the legal risks, okay? Obviously, if I pay money to somebody who in turn is going to, let's say, help me to get business or going to sell my products, um, then in that sense, then I uh, am creating FCPA risks. Sanctions, if I'm dealing with people and I don't know who owned them, uh, or let's say ultimate customer, and I don't know who the beneficial owners are of the company, uh, or I don't run them through a sanctions database, then I am creating legal sanctions risks. Ethical risks include conflicts of interest for obvious reasons, and um, ethical risks in sort of dealing with disreputable people. And lastly, uh, that is what I call reputational risk, which are bad actors engaged in bad conduct that we don't want to have as part of our uh, team in the sense, in the end. So that's the critical sort of uh, framework within which we work. And I'm going to start off a little different from, and if you've ever been to any of my other due diligence webinars, you'll understand this, but the market has moved in uh, a big way. There's technology and technology solutions. And I will tell you this, my experience is with all of my clients, with all of the people that I speak to in this area, the number one uh, benefit that I have seen is from automation. And now let me define what I mean by automation. Automation is not just the ability to run a check on Dow Jones International or using world compliance or using the red flag. What I'm talking about is a platform for the management of third-party risk. It's no longer an excuse to say we can't afford it. Uh, the government's not going to accept that these days. Um, and if your company is a mid-size or large global company, you, you should, and I mean should, uh, and I, I hesitate to say must, but should automate due diligence. It saves time and money. It increases, and by making it, the process more efficient, you create a win-win, a natural win-win situation where you can get the business to join with you, and the business doesn't resist the third-party uh, onboarding process. A lot of times, the onboarding process will require, you know, 45 days, written questionnaire, investigation, follow-up questions, and contracts and whatnot, it will increase your cooperation with your business. So it'll help to break down your silos because you have to join procurement. The number one issue I ask you all the time is, is procurement part of your due diligence process and are you using consistent techniques, databases, questions, etc.? You also, in an automated solution, can incorporate risk ranking formulas. So you can uh, take your specific factors that are important to you, the automated programs now that allow you to incorporate a risk ranking formula. It also creates, you preserve your documentation in one place, you have an auditable trail. You can put and upload every email relating to a particular third party onboarding process or vendor onboarding process and include in that. Let me take a step back on procurement and vendors. You can no longer just upload somebody by doing a deep or onboard somebody by doing a Dun and Bradstreet financial check, do a TIN check, your tax identification number, get their bank account and onboard them. 
that's a no, that's a non-starter. You've got to procurement has got to join the bandwagon here and get involved. The first step I always, like I said, is to get them on board. What are the expectations these days of DOJ and the FCC? Well, look, they know just as well as I do and you do that there are technology capabilities out there. Automation is something that works. Everybody who's automated is happier. So if you want to get happy in a fast way, the best way to do it is to automate your due diligence process. No longer are we going to use written questionnaires, get the questionnaire back, run it through Dow Jones, red flag, and then go from there. It's got to be automated, the collection process of information. Then, and if, you know, we hope and we pray that you don't end up before the Justice Department or the SEC, but if you do and you're not automated, you're going to have, you're going to, have to automate right away, but you're also going to have to um, uh, engage in some explanation. The OCSIF enforcement action in 2016 is an important action because what happened in that case is the Justice Department sort of made it clear, as did the SEC, that their expectations these days are much higher. And so it is not whether or not you conduct the due diligence. Now they're looking and examining not only the quality of the information that you have, but what did you do with that information? And OXIF was a case where they, uh, OXIF in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, hired uh, uh, a very disreputable third party agent and a joint venture partner. Um, and he became uh, then very controversial. And they went through everybody's email in reviewing the onboarding process of this to see what people said, who said what, and second guessed everybody in that context. So what I'm saying is it's not again about whether or not you conduct due diligence. Now it's the quality of your due diligence. So there are two other issues that they're very focused on in terms of dealing with them that they ask questions about and always want to hear about. Um, it all goes to the question of have you operationalized your compliance program? So monitoring and auditing. The uh, DOJ and the FCC have made it very clear, if you have auditing provisions with regard to your third parties and have not exercised them, in other words, are not auditing any of your third parties, they've got a problem. And they want to know, how are you monitoring your third parties? It's not just an onboarding process and then you just let it go at that point. They want to know more than that. They want to know what are you doing to monitor and how are you monitoring your third parties and how are you monitoring the high risk third parties and what exactly are you doing? And you have to be prepared to document it and show it. The other issue which everybody's heard about and has been discussed is third party training. Are you training your third parties or uh, are you making sure that they are training themselves and do they have their own type of compliance program? Some do obviously. And what kind of certifications and assurances are you getting from them on an annual basis or on a high risk case, maybe every six months? And what are you doing in terms of managing the risk by communicating with them your expectations with regard to their conduct? So these are where we are these days with, uh, with, the, third, with the Justice Department and the SEC, and I think this should be taken into account. So an effective due diligence system, in my mind, has to have 10, uh, 10 elements, required 10 elements. One, uh, obviously, written policies and procedures uh, with regard to your due diligence onboarding process, but then risk management. The business person has to participate who wants the third party. The business sponsor has to participate in this process. You need to have predefined tier levels and requirements for your due diligence. In other words, you can screen everybody, but then you have to triage them into follow-ups uh, and then potentially enhance issues. You have to have a risk ranking process, which applies consistent risk rules, a red flag protocol to identify and resolve red flags, contractual provisions. And you'd be amazed at how many companies where I have different people who are, um, who are writing and then executing 
contracts on a different basis. You also have to look at your purchase order procedures in terms of making sure that purchase orders, if that's the way you're going to go, uh, in, depending upon the nature and the extent of the or the size of the transaction, you want to include on your purchase orders some certifications or some provisions in there. Um, there has to be some type of internal review and approval process like we talked about with the Office case. I would urge you to use advice of counsel and documentation. Advice of counsel, I'm, I'm not as always trying to promote my business. We do provide advice of counsel, but you can also use in-house counsel uh, to do that as well. And uh, everybody should have a rational assessment of vendors and suppliers who create FCPA risks and who do not. I mean, you've got to decide and analyze them. Are there any vendors and suppliers who represent you, act on your behalf? Remember, this is a key point. People do not, you don't have to apply the same FCPA legal risk analysis for your vendors and suppliers. They do create reputational risks, ethical risks, but most of them do not create FCPA risks because they're not acting on your behalf. Now that goes as to how they interact with the, with the government, the foreign government uh, entities that they interact with. Do they represent you? But that does not mean that you don't want to screen vendors and suppliers who may be used as a means by which to funnel bribery schemes. In China, we see shadow vendors all the time. And that goes to then the integrity of your vendor onboarding process. That's where you catch those folks. And then finally, is some monitoring and auditing strategy uh, that has to be adopted, has to be written out, and has to be developed for each year. So let's go. There are a couple of traps that you should avoid. Um, and I see this uh, in, uh, across the industry in terms of due diligence traps and uh, some reminders. One, due diligence does not mean that you have to boil the ocean, as that phrase is used, although it gets on my nerves, uh, but you don't have to create a factual investigation beyond a reasonable doubt. Your factual investigation has to be reasonable inquiries. Look, we have clients who deal, and I know every company has to engage certain high-risk parties in high-risk countries if they want to do business. It never makes sense to me to not go into a country because it's high risk. It makes no sense. It's always a cost-benefit analysis. What are the benefits of going into the country? And then what are the, what are the costs, the compliance costs that we're going to need to make sure we can do this correctly? You also have to make sure that all your unresolved red flags are addressed. If you do not resolve all of your red flags and document how you resolve them, that's when trouble begins. We have a case of several numerous years ago, about eight years ago, where Mr. Bork went to jail for uh, ignoring and, un and not resolving four uh, red flags. And he went to jail because those red flags were presented by the government as unresolved, that he was aware of them, and he did nothing to resolve them. And they used those, the government used those, to put him in jail and convict him and to establish that he had corrupt intent and knowledge. Okay, so we also use legal opinions, risk mitigation, and monitoring audits as a way to mitigate risks and to and and the more that the higher the risk is, the more we're going to have to have with regard to these strategies uh, to reduce the risk and protect the company ultimately. Not all third parties are equal. So we have to make sure that one, FCPA risks require third parties that act on the company's behalf. They represent the company. The UK Bribery Act, um, and I don't recommend that you design an entire program based on the UK Bribery Act, but the UK Bribery Act concept of associated parties is, that's the term that's used, is much broader, and frankly, I think it would include vendors and suppliers, but has not been enforced. So remember again, with regard to vendors and suppliers, they create reputational risks, usually not bribery risks, because they don't act on behalf of 
you. So my uh, general practice these days with an automated platform is to screen everyone. I know that sounds outrageous to you, but we screen everyone because it's easy to do. It's a batch load type of system where you can, on an automated program, screen everyone. And that's where you start from after the initial screen. And then you have to, to sort of call through everybody after that. One key issue, and uh, it continues to crop up in terms of dealing my dealings with clients and companies and questions that I get asked is, bot number one, if you are not getting beneficial ownership information, if you are not getting beneficial ownership information down to the natural person who legally owns a business, your due diligence on its face is by definition deficient. I know that sounds radical. I know that sounds controversial, but trust me, you need to know who owns the business that you are dealing with. So why do I say that? One, let's go through the legal risk. FCPA risk. Hidden government interests are a common technique and becoming more common in a way for government corrupt officials to ultimately take their money out of a deal and take their bribes. It's also a way that hidden government interests is a way that for them to try to avoid detection. And if you don't ask who owns a company, it could be down to 1% of an, an equity interest. And I hate to tell you that, but if it's an FCPA risk, a third party that acts on your behalf, you have to get the due diligence down to the beneficial ownership. So that means your questionnaire has to require that question has to be included, who owns the company, and then you want documentation uploaded as part of your questionnaire process as to the ownership of the company. Two, sanctions. Obviously, you can't deal with specially designated nationals or let's say those are the SDNs from the OFAC list. The ownership has to be 50% or more. However, remember the combined ownership rule. If you have SD, multiple SDN, SDNs who then add up to 50% or more, then you are dealing with a prohibited entity. So we need to know that, but you also just want to know if you, I, I've had a situation where a company engaged another entity that was 25% owned by a SDN. But be very careful. Um, because uh, we have the Russia case right now with Exxon, where the CEO who, hired, who signed the contract was prohibited, but the company was not, and they went after uh, Exxon and sought $2 million in damages. We also want to make sure for AML risks, for obvious reasons, that we, if we have a politically exposed person, and we also want to know the biggest risk that I see in non-financial companies are third-party payment risks, where we're paying third parties who we don't know, or we're receiving money from third parties who we don't know. And there's just a, just a good practice to know who you are engaging in terms of a reputational uh, interest and in knowing who that would be. We talked about risk formulas. Automated solutions give you a choice of factors to use to risk rank, so you want to use a consistent formula across the board. The common factors that I look at are country risk, revenue, and spend. How much are we making from them? How much are we paying them? Do they have government interactions and length of relationship? If you have a 20-year relationship with a third party and it's had no problems, that's very important to me in terms of setting the due diligence level. A lot of times we have third parties who, let's say a CEO or an owner from years and years ago started working with on a handshake. I'm not going to rip into those people and say, oh, okay, now you got to do our you know, elaborate due diligence process. You're going to have to show some flexibility. Anyways, document your formula, get it internally approved, and have your lawyers look at it for them. You can have me look at it and say, this looks good. Here's what I would do, given the nature of your risks. 
So there are four required steps. There's what I would call the information collection part, which we're going to talk about. And then there's the analysis and investigation. There's the red flag resolution, and then the red flag or we'll call it risk mitigation strategies that have to be implemented. This is for onboarding. Information collection has now become a real art. Not art, or let's just say that we are now getting access to more information than we need sometimes. So we want to know the business sponsor and the circumstances, why do we need this third party, but then we use and incorporate in our automated solution, there's an open source intelligence check which gives us public information, adverse media, things like that, uh, that we need to sort of take a good look at. I always like to know the financial credit worthiness and business checks, every type of information. And I know basic info, internet information or Google searches are, you know, uh, poo pooed and whatever, they're criticized. That may be true if that's your only third part, your only information collection. But I've been very surprised by information we can obtain through uh, efficient uh, and people who know how to conduct uh, searches on the internet. And the new challenge is managing all this information. Okay, so we get all this information and how do we evaluate it? How do we know that it's important? What should we look at? Because you can get inundated with this. And this is why I'm telling you that the automated solutions and, and are helping in terms of culling information and what information. There are technologies out there. And if you saw my, uh, uh, we had a, live streamed webinar last week uh, from Exeter, which was very interesting about how you can use artificial intelligence in the third party due diligence process uh, and what's coming down the road. And it's really, there's some of exciting solutions that are out there. So gathering information is time consuming, analyzing information is time consuming, but automation is a way to manage the information flow and the more intelligent automated systems that are out there that provides more efficient uh, information, pre you know, presentation, review, and then you keep a record. What's amazing is you keep a record of the information that was presented to you. So you can always defend the quality of your uh, program. So what are red flags? And I, I know everybody already knows this. Uh, uh, and I know everybody knows this and I know everybody um, uh, you know, has been through this, but to me, there are circumstances which indicate an increased risk of corruption. So, for example, if there's adverse media about someone or a third party that indicates that they've been involved in corruption or allegations have been raised against them, that to me is a red flag. And in the absence of resolving that red flag, um, the government will rely upon that evidence to demonstrate your company's willful blindness, head in the sand. So we have to have a process to identify, resolve, and then document, document how we resolve the red flags. It doesn't require um, you know, a lengthy investigation, but it, what you have to do is show that you know that you know that you know about the red flag and that you took some steps to resolve it. Common red flags that I see are allegations of corruption or misconduct, adverse media, and just a note about adverse media. A lot of times in a lot of countries, adverse media reflects what? It reflects that there are um, political opponents. Uh, the media is not necessarily unbiased. Um, and you have to address those issues in terms of bias, but it doesn't necessarily mean that this person uh, can't accept all these allegations as necessarily true. There are a lot of political axes to grind uh, that people have in various political systems. Unusual compensation arrangements, obviously you know, payment schemes that, you know, pay my bank account in Malta, pay my bank account in Switzerland, I need a 10% commission. Uh, on this. Uh, existing or former foreign officials, uh, there are ways to use, to do business with a third party where you even have a foreign government representative that was in guidance uh, and 
uh, talked about that example going back to 2012. Close ties to an existing or former, former foreign official. Um, when you have uh, no track record in an industry, for example, I had a shoe business, uh, the owner of a shoe business who wanted to get involved in the oil and gas industry in Angola, and it turned out that person was also friends with the, uh, with the head of uh, Sonangol, that's going to raise issues for you to deal with. Uh, and obviously, the lack of transparency of ownership structure, if you cannot get down to the final end of who owns a particular company, that's going to be a particular issue you've got to deal with. So no track record in the industry, suspicious, and obviously we've talked about suspicious payment arrangements. So you need to then, if you have a red flag, one of the issues is you conduct a further um, factual investigation. You ask the third party about the allegation directly ask them and document their response and assess their credibility. Obviously, you do you research facts from media reports and other sources, and usually your business people can help you with some of that in terms of follow-up, and you document your factual conclusion. This is the reason why there was adverse media. It turns out this was what was going on. The, the adverse media doesn't include the resolution of what happened to these allegations and that no charges were ever brought uh, against the individuals or things like that. So you document those things so that you can uh, go forward. You also will document in this false positives. For example, you have a, a John Smith, and John Smith, you know, you've never, you, you need to get, for example, when you're working with a particular individual, you always get a copy of their passport or their uh, identification information so that you can make sure you can use that information for um, getting rid of false positives or ways to try to um, show that this information only relates to this person based upon this specific identification information. So how do we, when we get down to it then, if we do have some red flags, which uh, obviously are up, you can't resolve, the question becomes then, how do you mitigate these? And what are your strategies for mitigating these? And in my view, there's there are a number of good strategies that have to be used, and you can and you would uh, you would have to do that. So, for example, what I would suggest in this situation is one, we have these sort of strategies, um, representations and. Uh, um, representations and warranties that are tailored to the risk, uh, enhanced training, um, in, uh, additional certifications, uh, make these people a priority audit, enhance your due diligence investigation, you know, do an enhanced investigation, use your advice of counsel, or say, look, in six months, we're gonna redo the due diligence. One of my popular solutions with high-risk third parties uh, is to do uh, one thing that's what I think uh, is sort of a new expectation from the government, and that's um, detailed services and invoicing review. So what uh, we want to make sure that the services that the third party is providing are legitimate. And the way you do that is to require and detail this in the contract, detail a required description of services to confirm legitimate services. In other words, I want to know what their charges are based on, what their fees are based on, and if they don't, and I put this in the contract, if they don't provide a description sufficient to detail the services to make sure that they're legitimate, we don't pay the bill. So that means we want detailed invoices. The payment is contingent on the description and proper invoicing, and we set up an internal control process for review and approval of descriptions and invoice. Only in high-risk cases, only in high-risk cases would I involve the compliance staff in that. Normally what I would do is then train the accounts payable people who are more than happy and really usually very cooperative. And I would train them on how and whether or not they could participate and how they would review these and escalate the invoices before they pay them to me or to somebody else internally, but I would train them on what they're looking for, 
why they, this is being done and how important this is to the company. And believe me, they're more than happy to do it. If anything, they get nervous when they pay out money that they think is um, going to somebody who shouldn't get this money. So that's one very strong solution. It's a risk mitigation strategy that I would use with any third party representing you in a high risk area where there uh, is money to be made or they have a commission uh, or some of that their compensation based upon uh, incentives to get business. So we want to be careful with regard to that. Focus due diligence is where we get involved a little bit more in some third party uh, due diligence reviews. And the reason we get involved is um, there are usually pretty significant red flags and we have to deal with it and we have to try to get this there. It's usually for important third parties, agents, distributors, uh, things like that. And we want to document why or the government officials. That's another one where we get involved. Where government officials in an unrelated part of the government own a part of this, let's say, uh, agent company. So we want to document why uh, you hired uh, a law firm or an investigation company. We want to protect the attorney-client privilege, which is very important. And then you, if, for example, you hire a red flag or whatever to do a sort of more in-depth uh, investigation. It's very important that you tell them and direct them how you want to do this uh, investigation and what you expect with this investigation. So you want people who have boots on the ground, who can do interviews if necessary, they know the uh, practices, they speak the language. I always like to get uh, an inspection or a photograph of a local facility, um, try to interview some of the people uh, locally but I want you to supervise the investigation to make sure that it's done properly for you. And I also want you to review any report before it is finalized, because I've seen draft reports that were quickly turned into final reports and they contain uh, really incendiary allegations and things that we just didn't want. For example, I had a company that uh, interviewed 33 people about the reputation of a potential third party 32 people uh, responded by saying he's a great guy, this guy is you know, honest, has a lot of integrity, uh, good reputational evidence. And then one person said, oh no, he's the bag man for the Nigerian uh, oil company and he helps to mine water. Well, for whatever reason, the company put that allegation in there and it created a lot of headache for us down the road with respect to a uh, uh, government investigation. So that's why I say to review the draft report before you let them finalize it. Audit and termination rights, and this is a must have these days. Uh, your audit rights have got to be broad, meaning you cannot, uh, but you can, uh, you've got to have the right to designate somebody and to, or to go in there yourselves and look at the books. But looking at the books based uh, around your business, not you don't want to investigate the whole business. You're looking to make sure that all of the transactions related to your business uh, were done properly. Um, you also should include in your audit rights that if there is a government investigation, they should cooperate because I've seen situations where a third party will just say, I'm not going to let you look at the books for the government and that's it. So we want cooperation put in there because that would give you uh, the right to, to terminate the contract as a threat to them. Um, also, I would want the right for withholding payments um, when you have appropriate triggers, like for example, if they don't cooperate in an audit or they don't cooperate in a government investigation, I want them to, uh, I want to have the ability to, to withhold payments to them. I don't want to go to arbitration with the third party, uh, international arbitration with the third party over issues like that, and whether or not they're entitled to compensation. I want to, uh, we also want to make sure that they keep their records for a period of five years because that's our statute of limitations. And I want to have the right uh, to terminate them if I have a reasonable belief, okay, that either they or a sub agent is violating uh, the FCPA. So that's really uh, important. And we're going to get at the point here where we're not just talking about audit rights 
but we're talking about the the right uh, the the um, the uh, right to exercise those audit rights, and that people are going to want to see what are uh, how many third parties did you audit, how many do you do on an annual basis. Within your due diligence process, we have to have a review and approval process. So what do I mean by that? That means that there has to be a legal, a business review where there's a sign off. You just can't have the business person, but the business person's boss, and you want legal and compliance to sign off as well. And you want to document each step. And again, we want to have advice of counsel. In other words, it can be an in-house memo or an outside counsel memo, which we provide on a flat fee to memorialize the approval and say, go forward with these people. They're fine based upon this due diligence at this time. So let's get at really, I think, one of the more interesting issues these days and sort of the emphasis that's coming out of the government, which is what are you doing to monitor and what are your auditing practices? So there are a couple of things I'd like to talk about. One is with regard to monitoring, you cannot, in an automated solution, you cannot just sit there and say, well, we're monitoring because if there's a change in status of anybody that we've run through the system, we get an email that notifies us. In other words, you have a third party, all of a sudden uh, you do a, a, a check and all of a sudden, uh, let's say you did this three months ago, and then all of a sudden you get an email which says, oh, by the way, we told you three months ago that they weren't on the sanctions list, they've just been added to the sanctions list. That's not a monitoring program. That's part of monitoring program, but that does not satisfy the monitoring requirement. It's great that you do that, but we need, and I call that the dynamic notification process. And dynamic notifications is not enough, nor is invoice review for that one high risk uh, candidate enough as well. So my point is that we've got to start to risk rank and look at our monitoring uh, protocols and develop a plan that, bas that basically employs lots of strategies that you can use for testing, for just taking a sample. Look, you know, uh, looking at certain countries, let's say high risk countries and what you're going to do. So I want to put time and effort into monitoring. I also want to describe what I'm going to do and have the lawyers look at it and say, hey, that's pretty good. Audits. How do you audit your third parties? We've got the audit rights. Now let's select some third parties and do some proactive high risk audit. And then what do you do with that and how much time should you put into that program as well? So monitoring third parties, I like to do in several ways. One is I like to risk rank them even twice a year and risk rank my third parties and see where everybody is and have there been any changes or where they fall relatively uh, in the risk ranking process. Two, I also want to, obviously, if we do get that notification, we do have to do some follow-up and monitor them as well. In other words, once we get a, a notification that all of a sudden somebody has a corruption allegation that came up against them, we want to know that. So we want to use risk ranking as our, um, as our important sort of trigger for how we allocate whatever limited monitoring resources we may have. But let's let's do that. So what are some of our tools that we can use? There are a lot. We can do an audit, quote unquote audit. And there are many types of audits that you can do. You can do a financial audit. You can do a compliance audit. You can do a spot check audit. You can do a desk audit where you're based upon, you call the third party and request certain information and that they provide it to you updating that information. We can also do transaction testing, which I like to do. I think transaction testing and looking at the documentation for certain transactions is a good way to test them. So let's sample some transaction testing. Remember, I don't encourage you to just go out and do 100 or 10, let's say, which would be a ton, of financial compliance audits. What I urge you to do is take the resources and use sampling, use other techniques that can be, can be used. 
um, that don't require so much um, so many uh, resources to be allocated. Spot checks are important as well. Invoice verification. By spot checks, let me go back. It's like, okay, let's make sure we have a written agreement. Let's make sure the written agreement has this. Let's spot check um, uh, uh, and make sure a specific issue is being addressed. Unannounced visits are fantastic. Meetings, whatever. Uh, showing up at the third party is fantastic. Training and more training for higher risk candidate third parties is another great idea. More frequent certifications, um, we can do that as well in terms of having them certify as to compliance every six months. You can also refresh due diligence, provide additional training, or even send compliance reminders, or have them send compliance reminders to their own staff and draft them for them and give them to them. These are all techniques that you can use in terms of monitoring your third parties and how they should be uh, um, maintained. And this is a way, if you document it, it shows that you're um, engaging in risk mitigation strategies. So I think you should commit to conduct a minimum number of high risk third party um, uh, audits. And I would do three to five every year. And I would do other types of audits. But by, the, by three to five, I mean a compliance type audit, even where the compliance people go to the location and you start to pull information and request information when you go to do the compliance audit. So this to me is something that should be done um, every time that you can, but at least three to five. Uh, the Pfizer um, settlement in an FCPA case in 2012, I believe it was, included a provision that required five high-risk audits uh, to be done each year. In other words, not in response to concerns of any sort, but just because they turned out to be high-risk candidates. And you commit to this minimum number of audits, and then you conduct other audits which are less intensive uh, during, uh, during the year than you do. So when you have financial and compliance audits, um, another idea and another way to sort of leverage some of this is piggyback where you can, when you, when you, if you get your internal auditor to commit to this uh, and to help you in doing some audits, then you need to coordinate with them. And you can use a risk ranking formula with them that you develop with them for the top five to 10 high risk third parties. And then even divide the audits based on resources and risks and the type you want to do. Um, internal audit is excellent at financial audits. When you add compliance issues, yes, they can do it. Do I think they're the best or great at that? No, but um, you, I think it's something you have to do. Usually they look at uh, gifts and meals and entertainment, um, those types of expenditures. And uh, But I like to also um, interview people at the third party and try to find out more information, um, look at their training program, um, uh, things like that. And remember, we're talking about assigning audit resources based on relative rankings. So we have formal financial compliance audits, spot checks that I talked about, transition test, transaction testing, and then desktop or phone legal audits. Remember, there are lots of tools here that you can use. Do not think that audits means you have to send out a team of people and rip apart a third party. Um, it's something that just needs to be done and it can be done on uh, um, less than full sort of allocation of resources. What I like to do, and I guess what, what my ultimate thing here is that you gotta make your third parties your compliance partner. And it's a really tough, and I'm going to get to a tough issue, which is how do you deal with sub-agents, sub-distributors, particularly in the healthcare field, is really difficult because you go into certain countries like China, and what do you have? You have all the way down to sub-agents or sub-sub-agents who deal with a specific hospital to which you're selling your drug or your medical device. That is a really difficult situation because you are not in privity with those sub-agents or sub-sub-agents. So let's take it from the, the first 
the first step of uh, acknowledging here that let's say starting without sub agents or sub distributors, I want to redefine my relationship with third parties to bring them into the compliance fold. So when you have a strong third party relationship, a bigger company that you've dealt with for a long uh, period of time, I would push those compliance requirements out to them, included in contracts to require that there's flow down in terms of due diligence requirements for their sub agents and sub distributors. This is a really delicate balancing act, but it's something that you've got to do nowadays. And you can't, uh, and you can say to them, look, and you may have to do it this way, where you say, look, for your sub agents, your sub distributors, you can't hire them until you, we have run due diligence on them. Um, that's a difficult balancing act because are you going to get the same level of cooperation or not from the agents, the sub agents or the sub distributors? Or you can try to make the third party, assuming they have a good compliance program, responsible for the due diligence themselves or at least give yourself the right to approve or disapprove a sub agent or sub distributor. But it's going to create risks for you, and you've got to document and be very careful in terms of how you uh, manage this process. So it's an effective way to reduce risk in really complex distribution industries, not just healthcare, but also uh, high tech because of the chain of partners relationships. So you have layers of due diligence and risk analysis and calculation where your ability to control and your ability to exercise due diligence and document due diligence requirements diminishes as you get further down into the distribution system. Um, as always, we're looking for government owners as a high risk indication. If you have sub agents or sub distributors with regard to high, uh, that have government owners, it makes it really difficult. And you want to include uh, certifications and other types of requirements that flow down to your sub agents and sub distributors. This is hard. I'm not telling you it's an easy thing. It's going to be a problem when you get into uh, dealing with some of the high, uh, the high risk uh, countries and areas. Well, thank you. We're going to take some questions now, and I do have one poll question. Uh, just to remind you that we, uh, we we do offer services in this area. This is right in our wheelhouse. Um, check out our podcast. Check out our law firm and follow me on Corruption, Crime, and Compliance. Um, if you do have any questions, please uh, send them to me, um, and then we can uh, try to address, uh, address some of those. Um, I'm also going to uh, execute a poll here, which is anybody that would like us to follow up, uh, with them, please respond with a yes or a no uh, so we can get in touch with you to talk about uh, potential uh, services that we could offer uh, to assist you. One of the questions that came in, very interesting, should one also know the beneficial owner of a client, end client? It can be a tricky question to ask of someone who is superior to you. You are the supplier, they are the client. I agree with you, that's really tough, um, and that's a very, very good question. And uh, one of the issues is, um, you know, here you're looking for SDNs in that situation because they're the ultimate end user client um, and you're the supplier. In that case, it, uh, there may be a lot of people you can exclude from that because they're not going to, they may be publicly traded, for example, or something like that. But in certain cases where there's a potential that you can have one or more SDNs and you're in a high risk country, it is a good question, uh, I think, uh, to ask. Another good question came in, which is, is three to five audits per year a number you recommend independently of the size of the business, or is it a minimum increasing with size and risk of business? I, I think it's just a good number to do. Even if you're a billion dollar company, I think you can do it. Um, and I think it's worth um, it's it's worth taking a look at, and uh, in, but I think it's just a good number to have. You can differ on the size of the uh, entities that you want to audit, depending upon your risk, and uh, go from there. Any other questions? Please let me. Uh, please feel free to submit them. Um, uh, people have asked for a copy of the files. Uh, of the slides. Um, you should be able to download it from the handouts. Um, if you can't, just let me know. 
Um, and send me an email at mvolkoff at volkofflaw.com and I'll be happy to send you a copy of the slides. Um, and I apologize, it's a lot to cover in a very uh, short period of time. There's more issues to discuss, for example, like contractual provisions and other things like that that I uh, typically use uh, in these situations. So are there any other questions? Uh, please feel free to submit them and we can go from there. We'll be doing uh, some more interesting webinars uh, coming up on gifts, meals, and entertainment, and some other uh, good topics, uh, as well as testing and assessment issues of your program. Uh, okay, let's see. We may have another question here. Um, somebody said, you mentioned training. What is the best approach to ensure our people are adequately trained to run these programs? Well, ideally, I like... Um, in-person training, particularly if you're training people who are going to be uh, exercising controls, I think that you've got to make sure that you do that. Um, so, it, you, you know, for example, in the invoice um, training session there, I would absolutely train um, uh, the accounts payable people in person because it's usually a small, relatively small group of people um, well, and, you know, have some people uh, attend other ways as well, you know, through, uh, through um, let's say, an online capability. Uh, another question, if a current or former government official is an officer of the vendor, how do you address the scenario? Um, if they're not an owner of the vendor, uh, I'm less worried about that situation, and I think we can easily get you through that situation. Um, if you want more information on that. What I'm worried about with current or former government officials is how they would participate in a deal that they might arrange through bribery. So um, this would be something I think we could uh, take care of pretty uh, easily with a current or former uh, government official. Another question came in, should compliance perform self-control assessments on due diligence for third parties, customers, and contractors or should audit concentrate on this issue? Um, generally, I would see audit doing that, um, looking at your due diligence system and how it's working. I'm not necessarily looking at having um, uh, sort of self-assessments, but I mean, I don't see anything wrong in doing that, but I'm, I wonder if it's the best use of limited resources in that situation. Uh, I'd rather have somebody uh, external take a look at it, like internal audit, or you can have us do it. We do that uh, for people as well, and it's another service. Okay, folks, we're, we're at the, the, the witching hour, 10 o'clock here on the West Coast. Thank you again for attending. We'll be in touch, uh, and thank you again uh, for participating, and uh, we appreciate it. And remember, if you do want to send us slides, just email me, and I'm happy to send them to you. Thank you.